This screencast covers lines 1126 through 2530 of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Bertilak goes hunting three times in this section of our reading. The first hunt is for deer, in fact only female deer, known to be very shy. The hunters killed a lot of deer during this hunt. In fact, it probably looked something like this, only a little more medieval, of course. I'm sure that most of you found the description of the rendering of the deer a little more graphic than you'd like. Although I've only read an account like this in Sir Gawain, I understand that it is a ritual called the breaking of the deer and was a pretty common motif in French romances. The second hunt is for wild boar. You can see from this illustration just how dangerous such a hunt would be. Boars are known for their brute strength and so, unlike the deer, this animal puts Bertilak at some risk of injury or death. Bertilak's third hunt is for a fox, an animal that has a reputation for being tricky and deceitful. Even today, every Disney cartoon portrays a fox as intelligent and cunning. So what is Bertilak doing, uh, I mean, what is Gowan doing while Bertilak is out hunting? He's back at the castle with Bertilak's wife. Think about Gowan's experience with the lady during Bertilak's first hunt. She finds him in his bed and he pretends to be asleep. He's timid and shy. Remind you of anything? There is a correlation here between Bertilak's hunt in the woods and the lady's hunt in the bedroom. In fact, this juxtaposition of the two, woods and chamber, is a pretty common trope in romance literature. At the end of the day, Bertilak and Gowan exchange their winnings. What think you, sir, of this? Have I thriven well? Have I won with my woodcraft a worthy prize? In good earnest, said Gowan, this game is the finest I have seen in seven years in the season of winter. And I give it to you, Gowan, said the goodly host, for according to our covenant you claim it as your own. That is so, said Sir Gowan, the same say I. What I worthily have won within these fair walls, herewith I willingly award back to you. He embraces his broad neck with both his arms and confers on him a kiss in the comeliest style. Notice that Gowan doesn't give Bertilak a little kiss on the cheek. He wraps his arms around his neck and gives him a big kiss on the lips. Both men are living up to their promise. While Bertilak is hunting wild boar, Gowan and the lady have a second meeting. This time she's more direct in her advances toward him. She tells him, quote, But none can deny you, said the noble dame. You are stout enough con to constrain with strength if you choose, were any so ungracious as to grudge you aught. In other words, she tells him that his brute strength would be enough to overpower her if he chose to do so. Do you see the connection between Bertilak's hunt and her own? At the end of the day, Bertilak and Gowan once again exchange their winnings. Now Gowan said the good man, this game becomes yours by those fair terms we fixed as you know full well. That is true, returned the knight, and trust me, fair friend, all my gains as agreed I shall give you forthwith. He clasps him and kisses him in courteous style, then serves him up uh, with the same fare a second time. In other words, he kisses him twice. Once again, both men live up to their bargain. On the third day, while Bertilak is hunting fox, the bedroom encounter takes a bit of a change. The lady pulls out all the stops. When she comes to Gowan's bed this time, her, quote, bosom was all uh, but bare, and her back as well, end quote. She is trying her best to seduce him, but to no avail. Why won't he just give in to her seduction? Is he so pure, do you think? Does he not want to betray Bertilak? I mean, after all, it would be a courtly love romance, and the uh, husband's never supposed to feel betrayed. Or is it something else? Well, what if he does have sex with her? Won't he have to have sex with Bertilak at the end of the day in order to keep his promise? You have to think that that thought crossed his mind sometime or other. Anyway, the lady ends up giving Gowan her magic girdle. Oh, and a girdle back then was something very different than it is now. It was a strip of cloth tied around the waist and allowed to flow down the front of the dress. 
Uh, the lady in our illustration is holding her girdle in her hands, that long green kind of plaid strip. At the end of the day, Bertilak and Gowan once again exchange their gifts. I shall follow forth with the form of our pledge that we frame to good effect amid fresh filled cups. He clasps him accordingly and kisses him thrice, as amiably and as earnestly as ever he could. By heaven, said the host, you have had some luck since you took up this trade, if the terms were good. Never tr trouble about the terms, he returned at once, since all that I owe here is openly paid. Of course, we know that Gowan ha hasn't given the Lord all that he owed. He doesn't even mention the girdle. How very fox-like of him. Naturally, he is afraid of his upcoming encounter with the Green Knight, so is concerned about losing the magic girdle. Finally, we come to Gowan's encounter with the Green Knight. How terrifying this must be for him. I often wonder when I read this poem whether or not the girdle truly is magic, and even if it is, whether Gowan truly believes in it. After all, he flinches at the axe stroke and is wounded by the axe on the third stroke. So I'm not really sure. Um, maybe it was just a piece of cloth. In the end, he owes up to his lie, and Bertilak tells him everything, although I think he leaves a lot of things unsaid. In the past, some of my students have thought that Morgan Le Fay was Bertilak's wife, but Morgan was actually in disguise as the old lady, and Bertilak tells us that she was behind all of the events in this poem, and that she did the whole thing in order to scare Guinevere. Well, you know, I don't know that I follow that, because we hardly have mention of Guinevere in this, and did she seem that all that scared at the beginning? I don't think so. So anyway, that was, uh, we, we find out that she was uh, the old lady in line 2463. So Gowan heads back to Arthur's court and ends up where he began. Once again, like Beowulf, I guess you could also say like a year, this story comes full circle, right back to its starting point, all the way back to the mention of the siege of Troy that we read in the very first lines. Since Brutus the bold knight embarked for this land after the siege ceased at Troy and the city fared amiss, many such ere we were born have befallen here ere this. May he that was crowned with thorn bring all men to his bliss. Amen. So um, we come right back to almost the, the, the exact same words that we had at the beginning. And then we have this um, French motto at the very end. And it translates to shame to him who finds evil here. This is the motto of the Order of the Garter. And that order is still around today. And so you can see over here, here's the, here's the motto in French. And here it is on the robes. Um, and this is one of the highest orders of the British Empire. So um, the royal family would all be members of the, of the Order of the Garter. So a really high um, praise to be long to that. So the order was founded uh, by King Edward III in 1348, about the time that Sir Gowan and the Green Knight was written. Um, the story goes that the Edward, dan Edward danced with the Countess of Salisbury, and this is her over here, a raving beauty. Oh, I'm sure you can tell that. Um, anyway, during the dance, her garter fell off. And Edward picked it up and put it back on her. And of course, he had to put his hands under her dress in order to do that. And he's supposed to have said the motto then, shame to him who finds evil here. So um, why then does the, uh, the poet add these words at the end of this text? Is there supposed to be a correlation between um, Gowan's actions and King Edward's? Um, what sort of, of shame um, would we be bringing on ourselves if we found any evil in Gowan? Are we supposed to forgive him? And if we are supposed to forgive him, why? What is it about Gowan that, um, that makes his actions forgivable? So um, there must be a link somewhere. 
and I leave that up to you. Um, I'd like you to think about uh, not only the ways that this story um, contrasts with Beowulf and all of the things actually that it contains that are the same as Beowulf. Think about Gawain as a hero. How does, how does this hero differ from uh, Beowulf as hero? And um, also think about how this correlates with the whole story of the Order of the Garter. So lots of things to leave you with and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you.